Hello, I'm Chris Hoffman. On behalf of Empower Future, I'd like to welcome everyone to this Empower Hour. Before I go farther, I want to acknowledge that here in Colorado, we live on the traditional homeland of the Ute, Arapaho, and Cheyenne. Let us seek to understand the actions that took these lands from them and understand what it means to be in right relationship with them today and with this land and with all the creatures that inhabit it. Anyone concerned about social justice and climate needs to be aware of the situation at the Suncor oil refinery in Denver. The Suncor refinery processes dirty tar sands and generates massive amounts of greenhouse gases and other pollutants, including VOCs, particulates, hydrogen cyanide, and sulfur dioxide. And the refinery has been operating for years on expired permits. This plus Suncor's malfunctions that have sent clouds of orange smoke and ash over the neighborhood nearby have made the refinery a symbol of environmental injustice. Cultivando, an organization that serves the Latino community in Adams County, is on the front lines of taking action on Suncor's toxic pollution. Cultivando focuses on community leadership to advance health equity through advocacy, collaboration, and policy change. Empower Our Future is honored to have Olga Gonzalez, Executive Director of Cultivando, here to give us an update on their work and the situation at Suncor. Before I turn it over to Olga, I'd like to encourage everyone, if you haven't done so already, to view Cultivando's short video on Suncor called Suncor Sundown. We will put a link to the video on our website along with re the recording of a link to this recording of this Empower Hour within the next couple of days. Olga, welcome, and please take it from here. Yes, thank you, Chris and everyone at Empower Hour for having me here today. I also want to mention that with me is Phil Doe. He is a member of our advisory council for this air monitoring project, and he's also the um, environmental director for Be The Change. Um, with that, I will start sharing some of my slides to give you more information about the work that we're doing. Um, so, you know, as you probably know, you know, the Sunco refinery was uh, cited for, for violations. Um, and so they had to be part of a process where funds were returned to community organizations who were impacted through an SCP process, as they call it. Um, and so we renamed this project as AIRE, and I'll talk more about that, but in Spanish, AIRE means air. And so given the community that we're working in, um, that was a, a more relevant term rather than the Suncor SCP Air Monitoring Project. So AIRE stands for Air Quality Investigation and Research for Equity. And um, as Chris already mentioned, you know, we are a nonprofit organization based in Adams County. And we really believe in upholding the leadership of our community to ensure that their voice is heard around issues that impact them directly. And again, our work is based on our organizational values of community-led work, social justice, and collaborative leadership. We firmly believe that all people have the power to maintain fair and equitable systems and to ensure opportunities for their communities to thrive. And our approach is deeply rooted in the belief that those who are most impacted by inequities lead the most effective community work. The best programs and policies are developed with community members at the table who are meaningfully engaged. We work collaboratively to build health equity and community capacity for positive policy and systems change. And we do this by working directly with people who live in these communities. We call them promotoras and they are highly skilled and trusted experts in their community who lead our work. And in summary, we work with and not for our community. Um, so for this activity, you know, I know it's the end of the day, but if you could, you know, just envision, you might even want to close your eyes and think about nature or being outdoors and think about what comes to mind for you. You know, for many of us, it's things like clean air. It's like the beautiful outdoors with waterfalls, grassy areas, beautiful flowers, mountains, the outdoors. 
And that is also the vision that we would like to have for our communities, that they also can enjoy being outside and being in nature. We know that the earth can be very healing. You know, some of us have had opportunities to enjoy its benefits being, being outside, going on hikes. Um, some of the benefits can include, you know, having better attention spans. It can include reducing our stress levels, having better moods, less risk of mental health problems. And being in nature can also improve empathy and collaboration, which allows us to show up as our best selves. We at Cultivando and in our communities through our partners are fighting for environmental justice. Because when we go outside in these communities, these are things that we see. These are things that we face. So again, fumes, smoke, pollution, the, the yellow clouds that are coming out from the Suncor refinery, you know, all of these things, the water being contaminated with PFAS chemicals and the list goes on and on. So if you can imagine living in these communities, the effects that it has on our children, especially on our families. And so our focus is on environmental health, which is, you may know is a branch of public health that focuses on the factors of health impacts uh, that then affect, you know, in the, the connection between health impacts and environmental factors in our communities. In, and speaking of that, um, in looking at our own communities, you know, again, we're targeting Commerce City, Globeville, Illyria, and Swansea. Some of the most common contaminants are things like carbon monoxide, lead, nitrogen dioxide, ozone, PM or particulate matter, as well as sulfur dioxide. And then some of the corresponding um, health effects of that, you know, we, we find from community members reporting having headaches, having difficulty breathing, um, having bloody noses. And this impacts many of our children. There have been times in our community where schools have had to go on lockdown because the air outside was basically lethal. It wasn't safe for our children to be outside and children should never be forced to be locked indoors because the air outside can hurt them. And we've had many reports from families and children who felt too sick to go to school and learn, you know, who were not ready to go to school. And, you know, parents have had to take time off from work to take children to the hospital. Many of these families, um, you know, don't make a lot of money. And so that, you know, is also another barrier for them having to take time off from work, having to pay medical bills. And if these toxics that are in the air are causing children to develop things like asthma or headaches consistently, or even worse things like cancer, you know, that's gonna have long-term effects for them as well. So our, our program, Cultivando Aire, is doing air quality monitoring in Commerce City, Globeville, Illyria, and Swansea to investigate the harmful toxics emitted from the Suncor refinery and their effects on the health of our community. And we've known that for many, many decades, Suncor has been in our community. They have been allowed to operate with very little oversight. You know, we know that permits have gone renewed without a lot of community input, if any, and that, you know, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment is supposed to be looking out for the health of all of the, the residents of Colorado, and, and they're failing our community in many aspects. So the community asked Cultivando to step up into this role um, and take on this, this opportunity to use those funds to be able to do our own independent air monitoring. So Suncor has been monitoring itself and saying everything is okay when our community is reporting that clearly things are not okay. Um, Suncor's uh, monitoring um, pales in comparison to the technology that our monitors um, have. It, it is much more advanced. I believe Suncor's um, air monitors detect up to maybe three toxics in the air. The monitoring has been intermittent while our monitors are up and running and they measure up to 50 toxics, including radioactivity, which is something that had not been done before. And so we are looking to get clearer answers about what is in the air. 
Um, so with that in mind, we have a, um, a stationary monitor um, located near the Suncor refinery. We also have 25 purple air monitors, which are home-based air monitors that we've distributed to impacted community members who want to be active participants in learning about the environment and the toxics that might be seeping into their homes. And um, we also have a mobile monitor that moves to different locations every two weeks. And this is based on the input from impacted community members. So right now, for instance, it's at a, at a church in Commerce City, Our Lady Mother of the Church, because that is a request by community. And all of the air monitoring is being done by um, Boulder Air, which many of you are also familiar with, with Dr. Detlev Helmig. We also have a, another component, which is a health evaluation. And that is being carried out by professors and um, research assistants from the University of Denver and Colorado State University. They will be conducting interviews with community members to identify how living close to the refinery is impacting not just their physical health, but also their mental health, their quality of life. We wanna be able to bring these stories to the forefront because for too many years, our community members have been ignored or even silenced. So that data will also go hand in hand with what is being reported out of the monitors. Um, we also have a student internship. So we are in the process of selecting up to 25 young people from impacted communities in Commerce City, Globeville, Illyria, and Swansea to participate in an eight week internship where the focus will be environmental justice, um, health equity. Um, they will be working with law students from DU as well as medical students from Anschutz and many, many other people who want to invest their time in cultivating the next generation of uh, environmental justice warriors as we call them. So, you know, we believe that these communities that are being impacted uh, must also be brought into this process and be able to decide what they need um, in terms of next steps. Uh, this is what the monitors uh, look like. So we have the stationary monitor, as I said, it's at um, 3421 East 64th Avenue. It's on top of a, of a business. I think it's a trucking company. And then the mobile monitor is on the right. And so in this case, it was uh, in front of one of our community members' homes, and she was very excited. Um, but again, the more comprehensive um, monitoring uh, is coming from the stationary monitor. And some of those uh, contaminants are in the next page so that um, you can see what they're picking up. And so here is a bunch of toxics and chemicals and you know, volatile organic compounds, as well as a list of instruments. So for those of you that are more savvy on these things, that is, that is the list. Um, and the mobile site uh, is focused more on the, the VOCs, so the volatile organic compounds. And these measurements are coming in at near real time. Um, in addition to this, um, all of the information that's being gathered is being reported through um, a website with um, Boulder Air. And um, here's where you can find the data. So you could go onto cultivando.org. That is our website. And there is a link that you can follow that will take you to Boulder Air's page, or you can go directly to their page. Um, and here, it, it's not just for Commerce City, but I know that they're monitoring in other areas and other communities, but it'll have the, the toxics and the levels and things like that. And what we are finding so far, and we've been monitoring for a couple of months now, um, we've been finding higher measurements of particulate matter and hydrogen sulfide compared to other Boulder Air sites around Colorado. So already those levels have been elevated here. And we know that um, particulate matter is higher than the standard. Um, so that is of concern. Hydrogen sulfide peaked at 81 ppm in the last month. And the air odor thresholds range between 8 and 130 ppbs. Um, the particulate matter 2.5 peaked at 93 uh, UG, uh, I, can't, I can't really tell you what all that is, but it's concerning. And, and this was coming up in the last month. And so, um, so again, hydrogen sulfide is at the point where it is detectable by scent. 
Why this is important? Um, these are contaminants that greatly impact our health. Exposure to hydrogen sulfide can cause irritations to the eyes, to the nose, the throat, and it is highly toxic. PM 2.5 is small enough to penetrate deep into people's lungs when inhaled. Health risks include short-term problems such as coughing and shortness of breath, and long-term consequences such as reduced lung function and increased mortality from heart disease and lung cancer. Boulder Air is seeing much higher values in the Commerce City site than in any of their other sites in Colorado. So again, this is validating what many people have been saying. These are the very symptoms that they have been reporting. These are the very symptoms that have been ignored, even when they've sought to speak to um, you know, elected officials and CDPHE and others. Um, unless you live there and experience this, uh, it, it's really hard for people to really grasp that this could be actually happening. But we have enough uh, people in community who've been reporting this and demonstrating those symptoms. And then as far as resources, um, you know, just here are just some links um, if people want more information about what all of this means. Um, here are some places where you can go for that. And then in terms of, I think we skipped this one. Okay, can everyone see this one? Okay, so we do have a call to action. Um, we were funded for one year to do this, and we also recognize that one year of funding is just allowing us to scratch the surface and that um, air monitoring will need to continue, that once the reports are in, people will have concerns about what their rights are. They will be talking perhaps about reparations um, and just a way to do right by community that has been harmed for so, so long. So um, of course, we're always looking for funding to continue in this work because it must continue. Um, so our funding is, is limited and we need to keep this up for years to come. You can also support us by making your voice heard, by submitting public comments, uh, volunteering. Um, there's a variety of ways that you could support our efforts. So um, we're, I think if Phil, if you have anything you'd like to add to this, if not, we can, you know, begin the, the Q&A part. I, I think you've done great, Olga. Let's hear what people have to say. So Chris or anyone from the Empower Hour side, are there any comments or anything? Yeah, we have, uh, well, I only have one in here. RJ Harrington um, says, I missed how much funding was provided for the first year. How much more is needed annually? Yeah, we learned quickly that air monitoring and building all this and the equipment costs a lot, a lot of money. So the initial funding we received was um, close to $1.8 million. Most of that is going to the research and to the air monitoring. So it is definitely a, a huge uh, amount of money that is needed to continue. And we wanted to be very mindful that, you know, the science of it is very important, but so is the education, so is the people part of this is that um, you know many people have spoken to us uh, from a scientific standpoint, but I also want to bring forward the human uh, impact of this, um, you know, the faces of those who are living in this community every single day. So that's you know a good idea for how much it costs to do all of this. With the funding, we were also able to hire a director of environmental justice who would have been here, but she's in another event also to raise awareness. We also hired um, someone to help us build out our website so that um, that is in development. It will be on our Cultivando page and it'll have a snapshot of what Boulder Air is reporting because for our purposes in community, um, yes, knowing the names of these toxics is important, but most importantly, we wanna know why it does this matter. So if this is a high in high concentrations, how does that correlate with the symptoms that my family and I are feeling and what do we need to do? It is a way to also alert our community to let them know, hey, today may not be a good day to be outdoors, especially if you're a small child, if you're an elder or somebody with a compromised immune system. So we wanna make sure to keep protecting our community. Okay, I don't see any other 
questions, if you folks out there have questions, please type them in. Okay, here we go. Anna O'Brien. What is happening concerning the leases that are out of compliance? And so yeah. let me kind of broaden that in terms of what is the, from the legal and regulatory front, what is going on to try to solve this problem? Phil, did you wanna add? Yeah, sure, I'll take that, Olga. Um, well, as, as most people know, there are two permits out there under the Clean Air Act, both of which have expired. One's been expired for over a decade. Um, EPA Region 8, which is now headed by Casey Becker from Boulder, who used to be a state senator, or state representative, sent the, the permit back to the state telling them that it was inadequate. And among the, among the issues that were raised by EPA was the fact that they have no idea what the cumulative impact of Suncor is on the Denver population and particularly the people living around the Suncor refinery. So the state, Polis's people are now reviewing what it is they need to do to get that permit for Suncor. When that's resolved, we don't know. But it's a very strong letter that EPA sent back to, to the state, very strong. Kind of unusual in, in that environment. Does that answer the question, I hope? Yeah, that's, that's good. Um, so Steve Whitaker says, is the refinery in violation of air quality standards? Who is responsible for enforcement? I think that's pretty much what you just answered is, is EPA, right? Well, I mean, it's all, you know, the states has the responsibility. EPA allocates these responsibilities to the state if the state wants to take them on. The question before us now is, is the state doing an adequate job? Given EPA's recent letter, and given Olga's understanding of what goes on in the community, I think we can say emphatically, no, the state is not upholding its constitutional responsibilities to the people of the state. And they haven't been for a long time and that's gotta change. That's why Cultabondo is there. If this is Suncor is causing all these health problems, short of moving Suncor, is there a way of fixing the plant? Are there other plants that do what Suncor does that don't have these problems in the surrounding neighborhoods? Or is this just inherent in the industry? Well, you know, I, there, I think there are about 30 refineries in this country and some have closed. There's one in Philadelphia that blew up. And the cost of, you know, retrofitting were so great, they just gave up. Uh, in California, they have huge problems. In Richmond, just outside of San Francisco, just south of San Francisco. Uh, they're much ahead of us in California. They're doing better jobs of monitoring in Torrance around Los Angeles. Uh, they have a four-prong monitoring program where they actually put probes down the stacks uh, and get instant information what's coming out of those stacks. That's what we need here, you know, and we need it in the worst way. I don't think there's any way these places, I mean, they take poison and they manufacture a different poison. I mean, I, how are you going to make a silk purse out of that? I don't think you can. I think they can make it less poisonous, but without, you know, prejudging what the results are going to be, I don't think the possibilities are very good that Suncor can ever be responsive to the needs, the health needs of the people living around that refinery. I just don't think it's, I mean, you know, they're, they're importing tar sands from Canada. I mean, how absurd is that? We, we're the fifth and sixth largest oil and gas producer in the, in the nation. And yet they're producing tar sands, the dirtiest product, as James Hansen said, of all the fossil fuels. They're importing it all the way from Alberta. Does that sound like people that really care about the community? They own the tar sands in, Cal in Canada. That's why they're importing. <laughs> Suncor is the yeah. second largest corporation in Canada. That's good. So Olga, for your community, what do they see as a solution? Yeah, that's a that's a tough one. I think that you have some community members who are just learning about this. For many of them, it was like, yeah, it smells funny. Yeah, the air, the clouds look yellow, but that's just the way it is. 
You know, they, they, they haven't been informed uh, or empowered with the information to make those types of conscious decisions about what to do. So some people are like, well, that's the way it is. Others are like, shut them down. So you have all kinds of extremes and some somewhere in the middle who say, can there be stricter regulations? Can, you know, our voice be taken into consideration? I will say that um, recently when CDPHE was going to allow them to uh, continue and, and allow them a, another um, permit to, or, or renewed a permit, the community felt very betrayed, particularly because they'd made it very clear to CDPHE that there were these concerns and that you know they wanted their voices to be heard. And so they felt like now that we had these air monitors uh, that you know this, this, the state would wait to see what the results were before making any types of decisions. And that's not what happened. So many members of the community feel betrayed by those who are supposed to protect them and listen to them, particularly because they were assured that they would, particularly because we have an environmental justice department within CDPAG that we have worked with and have expressed our concerns to. And so there is a lot of, a lot of distrust and uh, frustration. Um, we also know that um, Suncor has done a great job of messaging uh, you know, in PR, they, they donate a lot of money to the community. And so some folks see them as, as an asset. They think, you know, they're employing people here. They're, you know, we have the Suncor Boys and Girls Club, you know? So they've spent a great deal of, of time and resources to create that image, but people are only now becoming aware of the harm that they have been exposed to for, for far too long. And if you can imagine what these monitors are picking up in a few months, just imagine the end of the year. And then imagine what that cumulative effect is for families who've been there for decades and decades, mm -hmm. who now are wondering if their relatives who developed cancer and lived in the community wondered if there's some kind of an association. And we've had people who've said, you know, when we go away for the summer to visit family in Texas or Mexico, my kids have none of those symptoms. And we come back and the symptoms return and they were like, we never made that association. Mm -hmm. and so now they're being empowered with this information. So it will be interesting to see what the community will feel or want to request at the end of this project. So I have two questions, one for Phil and one for Olga. Phil, is the tar sands coming in by truck or pipeline? And Olga, that, that slide you showed with the different layers of, of the um, the stationary monitoring, the mobile monitoring, the health assessments, the student interns. That was a really interesting slide. Maybe it's some after Phil answers the question, you could put that back up and give us some more information because it, it sounds like you have a really robust program developed and I'd be interested in hearing more about those other components. Sure. So Phil, is it coming by truck or pipeline or? No, I, um... I, they claim that uh, 15 to 20% of their production comes from tar sands. I mean, think mm -hmm. about that. <laughs> but it's piped. Uh, we're, we're certain of that. It, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they claim they spent $4 million. You know, they didn't pay that much money. for. There were two refineries out there, and they bought them both in stages. And I think it had cost them about a half a billion dollars, $500 million. But they claim they've they spent $4 billion in upgrading the place. But I think a lot of it was the pipeline to bring in the tar sands. But that, I, you know, that's just me. Uh, so I, I'm sure it's piped in. Okay. Thank you know, you. They, they're the largest, they, they do a lot of uh, uh, asphalt and that bitumen is almost asphalt when it gets here. So I think a lot of that is probably used for all asphalt production. They're the largest asphalt producer in the state. Okay, Olga. <laughs> share this. Um, yes. This that. is the slide you were referring to. Um, yes, that one. Yeah, we um, we were very mindful that um, you know through this project, although we value all of the work that the universities and scientists are bringing, again, our hope was to really dignify the voices and experiences of community members who felt silenced and who've been harmed. And so for me, um, I think the heart of this whole project is really um, the community. Um, 
you know, and, and, and looking at ways to get them this information. So they, we, we, we will be doing tours with community members who would like to see the, the monitoring and, and what that looks like. And, you know, I personally visited the mobile monitor that's at the church and, and went inside and they were showing me the equipment. And although I'm not a scientist, you know, it was, it was great to understand just the level of, of uh, technology and, and expertise that goes into this. Um, and so we want our community members to be informed so that they could feel empowered with this information to go in front of city council, to go in front of, um, you know, these government agencies and say, do not grant these permits. Um, and so that, you know, this community facing peace is so critical for the success of this, because if it was just a bunch of scientists coming in and monitoring and there was no community input, no one would care. No one would be connected to it. I mean, the two go hand in hand. And so we were, we were very mindful. And that's why we ended up creating such a robust plan that has the science and the human part and the education and the health of it, because you can't separate one from the other. They're interconnected. And so even with the purple air monitors, while we know they're not as sophisticated as the larger monitors, it was really important to provide an opportunity for the average community member to be engaged in this and to understand what the monitors are picking up for them to understand perhaps what is seeping into their homes because so much of the focus is outside out there in the environment, but we forget that there are people in those communities who are experiencing real effects of this. And so that is a tool to engage and empower them and to bring them in you know, we know traditionally, especially lower income communities and communities of color in particular, have not been at the forefront of these movements for environmental justice. And so I think that many organizations are starting to understand that. And so these are ways to invite them into this space. Um, and then again, the health evaluation. Um, I can tell you that I hear stories of parents who will say things like, now that I'm learning this, I feel really depressed. Um, and there is research that I've come across that is stated, unfortunately, that people who live close to, um, you know, uh, major pollutants like this, like refineries and others, experience higher levels of suicidal thoughts. They could become this sense of hopelessness. Like, and I've heard from mothers who were crying to me saying, now that I'm learning this, I feel helpless. I feel guilty. All of the symptoms my kids were reporting, I was ignoring. I thought they just didn't want to go to school. And, and they blame themselves. They feel a tremendous amount of guilt. And then they will say things like, it is my fault because I'm poor, because I can't afford to move out of here and take my family to a safer place. And that just crushes my heart because it's not the fault of the community. It is the fault of Suncor. It is the fault of government. It is the fault of health departments that are not doing their job. And people are tired of it. And so that's where the health evaluation piece comes in. And for the students, for our young people, you know, they are our future. And if they are not engaged in, in being a part of, of their environment and environmental justice efforts, you know, then what can we look forward to, you know? So we must engage these young kids from low-income backgrounds who are largely Latino, kids of color, who are usually not in these spaces to, to let them know there are um, opportunities for you uh, as a profession, as a calling, um, you know, that exposure to law students and medical students and environmental justice activists might open up their thinking around what they want to do in their future. And that might inspire them to go to college and learn these things. Because on top of that, they're living in an environment where the earth is polluted, the soil is polluted, the water is polluted, the air is polluted, you know, and then you have all of these other factors and then you have environmental racism. What can that do to the mind of a child, a developing child? So we wanna give them a sense of hope and empowerment. And so that's why we thought through this um, in that way and that community facing and, and community empowering was at the forefront. Uh, Thank Olga, you. this is Paul. Um, could you speak about a specific example of community members who Cultivando has interacted with and changed their attitude, changed their thinking, maybe given them hope? Yeah, I think like 
you know, many of us know, and, and this is how I learned about uh, the amazing Phil Doe and others who've been part of this, you know, I was out there, I could say, minding my own business, being an executive director. And, you know, Cultivando does a lot more than just the IDA project, if you can even fathom that, you know, uh, a small team at the time, it was six of us, three were part time. And so it was community members who kept coming to us and saying, something's in the air. Why is the school on lockdown? Right. And so, you know, I would hear them and say, yeah, I really don't know. But because Cultivando believes in, in empowering our community, one of our programs is really focusing on leadership development. And we have our own in-house promotora model. And this is a model that we've trained many even around the state. And so there's a there's a woman, um, she'd probably be embarrassed, but Lucy Molina, you know, and she's in Commerce City, longtime resident. And she went through our promotora training several years ago. She said she came in and she was kind of like, you know, single mom, not too outspoken. It's hard to believe now if you see her. <laughs> but at one time, this was who she was. And she said, you know, after I went through the promotora training, I felt empowered. I felt like I could elevate my voice, like my voice mattered. She is one of those mothers whose children have had some of many of these symptoms. She is one of the many mothers who felt helpless and unheard. She is one who has shared that um, the schools were even looking at her like, you are a negligent mom. Your kids are always coming to school late. You know, we might have to report you to Child Protective Services. So what does that do to a parent? You want to just silence yourself and not say a thing. So the more that she participated with Cultivando and connected with people like Phil in community, um, you know, she was very passionate. So she would come and educate us about what was going on. She would go to all the meetings and bring that information to us. And it's because of her experiences and her vision that we are where we are today. She kept bugging, bugging, bugging and saying, Olga, Cultivando needs to apply for this fund. And I said, we're not an environmental justice expert, you know? And she says, that's okay. Cause I have all the experts. And let's write this grant together and let's make this happen. And so for me, this is why we do the work that we do at Cultivando. And this is why we have the IDA project and all of the different components and why we're having this conversation now. It is the first time in the history of Commerce City and maybe even the state that funds were truly invested in the impacted community through an organization that is led by members of the same community. When everyone talks about equity and environmental justice, this is what equity looks like. Give the power, the funding to organizations that are working with the impacted communities and who look like those communities. It makes a world of difference. So to answer your question, that is Lucy Molina. I, I don't know, Olga, if you've seen the comments in the uh, Q&A, but RJ Harrington says, Lucy crushes it during the CDPHE public comments. She's amazing. She is a powerhouse. And, you know, and she always um, credits Cultivando for supporting her. But I think we, you know, we do this together. And so as an organization, we are led by our community, but they want us to focus on that's our focus. If the community had said, we don't care about this, uh, we probably wouldn't be here. But it's because of Lucy's passion and commitment and her efforts to educate the broader community that people started to think about this. Uh, Olga, is the community taking legal action or contemplating taking legal action against Suncor? As far as I know, the community that I work with, there we're at a, you know, I think with our organization, given the population we're in, primarily Spanish speaking, some who are, you know, have different immigration backgrounds and situations you know, taking legal action is not necessarily the first thought that people have. I think right now it's more about education and informing them and, and giving them opportunities to make their voice heard. I don't, I'm assuming that with some of our partner organizations who are working with uh, folks who are maybe in the environmental justice space, who are English speaking, it could look different, but I would not be surprised if people would consider taking legal action. It is their right. Okay, I have a question for Phil. Um, could you explain some of these acronyms, the CDPHE and the oh, yeah. APCD and AQ, sure. whatever, and sure. how this sure. all works together? 
Yeah. First, I'll have to give you my gloss on state government. Our, our state government wasn't developed for the 21st century. It certainly wasn't developed for environmental protection or public health. So the CDPHE is a department that has responsibility for air quality, a division within the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment is the Air Pollution Control Division. It has primary responsibility in issuing permits, pollution permits. But what you should know, which got fair press not too long ago, is that one of their first responsibility is to, is to uh, model for how much pollution is coming, gonna come as a result of these permits. And they haven't been doing it. And so they moved the head of the, the APCD, the Air Pollution Control Division, out as director, but they immediately found a new position for him. And without irony, they named the position executive director for regulatory oversight. So that gives you some idea of what we're fighting at the CDPHE in terms of real honesty and, and uh, towards the people that live in that community. There, there isn't a lot there, you know. And, but it's all divided up. So the COGCC has responsibility for other parts of oil and gas, but the AP, and none of this is integrated. You've got five or six laws out there that are on, all ongoing and there's no integration at all. But I'd like to say one thing about the first question about the costs and the $1.7 million budget. I worked in the federal government and I was fairly high up in the government and I know what government budgets look like. I we are looking at what it would cost to go out another couple of years so that no longer could the state nor the Suncor dodge the real question about harming the public. I think we'd have enough information then that we could answer that question, but it would be around a million dollars a year. Trust me, that that is, ask this APCD, if it could monitor Suncor doing what Culte Bondo is doing and the outreach they have in the community for a million dollars, they couldn't even touch it. They couldn't even come close. I mean, this is this is as this is as sharp a pencil as you can find, and people should realize that they're getting one hell of a deal here. And the Cultivando's efforts should be continued for at least one or two more years, so we can we can finally answer the question: How much harm is being done? That's the question, and we don't have the answer. And there are a lot of people that don't want us to have that answer. But the state has an obligation under the Constitution to find the answer. Sorry, Olga. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> there is another question coming in. Uh, is there did from some from RJ Harrington? Did we miss public comment? If not, when is or are the deadlines for public comment about uh, Suncor? <laughs> well, which public comment? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this just 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 amplifies the problem that you know we have is you've got a rulemaking on on a water permit for, for Culti Pondo that's coming up. It's not closed. You know they have all kinds of PFAS problems out there. They discharge a tremendous amount of water into the, into uh, what is it Sand Creek and then the, then it's the upstream of 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 you know some wells that Brighton uses, Commerce City uses, uh, and they have an air quality, they have these two air quality permits that they need for Suncor to continue to operate eventually. I mean, eventually. And those, you know, they just sent they sent the first one back. So they have the state has 45 days, I think, to clean that up. And there'll be another public hearing and, and public process once that's done. But you know. Suncor is the largest individual polluter in the state. Now you can say that there's more CO2 that comes off Comanche 3, but it never operates, though we pay for it. But Suncor operates every day. And it at least just one pollutant, just greenhouse gases, it, it probably produces 900,000 tons a year. That's more than the tailpipe exhaust of all the new cars sold in the state in 2019, think of that. And, it's, and these people live right in the middle of it. They live, they live right in the middle of the biggest exhaust pipe in the state. How can this continue? 
and you know they 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 do they uh, twenty tons of of hydrogen cyanide. It was it's a poison. That uh, you know what Detlef is just he's had some problems. The high hydrogen sulfide it's a poison. It was used as a poison gas in the First World War. So so to circle back to the, the question, what is the best way for Colorado citizens to to pressure the state to do the right thing. <laughs> Olga? I, you know, the, you asked about the best ways to pressure the state. I started, um, sorry, I started reading some of the questions and didn't hear the full question. Well, how can we best pressure the state to do what it's supposed to do, Olga? Yeah, well, I would hope that, you know, with the, the results that are coming out of our monitoring, we have some data to back up concerns, because I think for many people, it's felt like, you know, their experiences haven't been taken seriously. And so we have to back up those experiences with, with data, with facts. Um, we're also up against the fact that Suncor, um, you know, has billions of dollars. Uh, we have one million to do a lot of work. And so, for instance, when we want to approach our, um, our local schools and say, can we place our stationary monitor here? They will say, well, you don't need to do that because Suncor already has stationary monitors at several of our schools. And so we have to also educate our elected officials. They know, you know about as much or less than I do about this science. And so for them, it's like, well, you know, Suncor is reporting this. And so, if the monitors are already there, why would we need cultivandos? And they don't understand the difference in, in the level of uh, technology or the amount of toxics that our equipment is measuring versus sun course. And so we're hoping to gather that data and present it in front of everyone who will hear us. We're hoping that allies and community will show up and amplify those voices and create forums such as this so that we can continue to tell our story. We are hoping that um, folks can lend their time and expertise to us. You know, we're, we're trying to be website developers and scientists and community outreach experts and all of the things all at once. And, you know, we're a small team. We're 11 people now. We grew by five. And again, we have many, many other important programs that we're running in addition to this one. And so we are always looking for, for people who can support us. Sometimes we are learning about, um, you know, like the Environmental Justice Act or things like that, you know, and, and so I've read through it, but again, I'm not a lawyer. So I need, uh, you know, our law students that are supporting us to help interpret that because it might sound, some things might sound good initially, but unless you have somebody who can really comb through these documents and they can catch and say, uh, these areas are problematic, um, you know, we won't have that. So I think, just about everyone could support these efforts and could amplify it. If you have connections to reporters, to elected officials, to other organizations who could join, join forces with us to really make a change. I think that's what it takes. This is not just Cultivando's project. And the work that we're doing, even though we're a Latino focused organization, certainly isn't just benefiting the Latino community, it's benefiting the broader community. I also worry about the workers at the Suncor refinery who are there every single day, every single day. You know, so um, there's a lot of work to be done and probably we need support in areas we hadn't even thought of. I know that writing these grants is not really why any of us got into this work, but it's important. We just um, just about killed ourselves writing a grant to the EPA in order to continue this. Also uh, grants that we've submitted to the state, to the Office of Health Equity. So I think there is another related question if we're seeking foundations, private donors, everything. I think everyone uh, can contribute to this effort. Um, so certainly, you know, any kind of support from any, any source is welcomed. Thank you. We, we had uh, some people who joined late and missed the introduction of Phil Doe and his relationship to Cultivando. So maybe if you could just kind of repeat that for folks who joined late. So yeah, Phil is the environmental director for Be The Change. And there is much, much more to Phil as, as you will see, you know, he's worked in many different spaces, has a long history of, of working in this space. 
um, and he is a part of our advisory council. That is another component of this project that I, it's, it's obvious and didn't mention. We uh, set aside funds to enable us to have monthly gatherings with, um, you know, community experts such as Phil and, and community experts such as those who live in Commerce City and are impacted so that they can have an assurance of updates of what's happening. They can ask questions. We promise full transparency every step of the way. And so Phil is one of the members of our advisory council. Thank you. Uh, you know, just to add a word about what August said about who to contact. I mean, it's pretty clear, I think, that nobody's going to run against Polis. And so, I mean, our options there are to, to, to make him understand that those of us who voted for, the, for him the first time are not very happy about what's transpired over the, over the intervening four years. And that he needs to take a harder look at what's being done to our air quality and how much, how much the oil and gas industry, quite frankly, contributes to our you know, abysmal air quality. And I think that you might look to Bennett. Uh, he's, you know, he, he's up for reelection, but he said publicly that Suncor shouldn't be there. Well, it's time to act upon uh, that statement, uh, Mr. Bennett, and get funding so that, Sun, so that Cultivando continue its work with Boulder Air. That, that's what needs to be done. And these, these people need to get behind this action, it, it is it's about as razor sharp as anything can be. And I say that with in all honesty, and I know how, you know, I know how budgets are work, work. So, you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's a big climb, <laughs> it, but uh, you've got some dedicated people. I tell you what, let me take a moment here to officially thank Olga Gonzalez uh, from Cultivando and Phil Doe uh, for his assistance to Cultivando in this important project. Um, if people have additional questions, uh, the speakers have agreed to stay on. So obviously feel free to, to put your questions in the Q&A uh, and you'll have an opportunity to ask them. But I'm just gonna take a moment uh, to say that uh, we have an upcoming event in May, on May, I'm so sorry, I have to look, or Paul, could you pull up the slide? Uh, May 12th, we, uh, Empower Our Future, are hosting a Boulder County Commissioner's Candidate Forum, and we hope to have all the candidates uh, here to answer your questions and talk about their platform. Uh, we do plan to uh, solicit questions from the community to ask of the commissioners. So uh, kind of maybe start thinking about that. Um, and it looks like maybe we do have more questions coming in. But again, I wanted to thank Olga and uh, uh, Phil. It is, it is really heartbreaking to hear about these communities being impacted. It's just so unbelievably unfair. Um, and I almost feel a little bad mentioning that uh, Empower Our Future. I don't feel bad because I know you'll support us, but we, we are working hard uh, on a campaign called Pull the Plug on Pueblo 3. Uh, Pueblo 3 is what we refer uh, to when we're talking about Comanche, Excel's most uh, recent coal-fired power plant. Um, we call it that because we don't believe that uh, Native communities would like to have coal-fired power plants named after them. Uh, anyway, we're working hard to put pressure on the Public Utilities Commission and the Excel Board of Directors to uh, put a stop to this plant, which uh, I mean, the good news is it has been offline quite a bit in its lifetime. However, when it's operating, it's uh, the largest source of carbon dioxide in the state, uh, as, no, as well as a number of other really dreadful uh, chemicals uh, that it spews. So it's time for that to go. 
Uh, and again, Cultivando, we look forward to supporting you in, in your efforts uh, as you move forward. So Chris, did you see other questions or Paul? Uh, other just questions? some, um, the, no, I didn't see any others. I just wanted okay. to emphasize again that we will be putting the video of this webinar on our, the Empower Our Future website, along with the link to the excellent um, documentary, 10 minute documentary from Cultivando on Suncor Sundown. And if you haven't seen that, I really recommend seeing that. It, it gives a, put some more human faces on, on the problems here. So thank you very much, Olga and Phil. We've really been honored to have you here and we wish you great su success in, in moving forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question. Um, I'm not sure who it's for exactly, but it's it's talking about uh, Suncor is looking into maybe converting some of their production to hydrogen. Um, <laughs> is there been any discussion with the Denver Suncor plant and line one? I guess line one is the pipeline that brings in the tar sands. Apparently, well. It it's just a spur. They were already bringing tar sands in the United States, as well. No, but I, I think mm -hmm. they ran a spur down from Minnesota, probably. To, but I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know the entire engineering of that. Well, I, I haven't heard anything about blue hydrogen from Suncor. Uh, uh, we should resist that with all our might. Uh, but anything's possible. I mean, these people are not, you know, it, as English. Uh, fellow said property never sleeps and so i i mean i i think you have to be always on the alert and to the idea that these people will try and continue their operations and, and their money their money and interests as long as they can and they will seek whatever avenue they they can find to continue their existence and their money making efforts so but i haven't heard anything about it have you olga I, no i haven't Allison, I, I just don't, I haven't heard anything about that. I, I also wanted to add that uh, the Suncor Sundown documentary is actually a collaboration. It's, uh, it's Cultivando, but it's also Woman from the Mountain, whose executive director is Renee Miller Chicon. She is also an indigenous woman who's been you know, fighting for environmental justice. She actually had run for office and was not elected. So I think another thing we can do is elect people to office who really care about the environment. And it's also a collaboration with Spirit of the Sun, whose executive um, director, Shannon Francis, is also from the Diné Nation. And so um, I myself, I'm, I'm from Mexico. I'm also an indigenous woman. So it's really interesting that many of these efforts have, are being led by uh, women in our community, um, you know, including Lucy Molina and, and others. And so um, it's so fitting, right, as we come close to, uh, you know, where we celebrate, you know, Mother Earth um, and people are talking about it. These are these are ways you can watch the documentary. You can support these organizations. And I do appreciate, you know, whenever we start out with these land acknowledgments and also thinking intentionally about what we can do to demonstrate this acknowledgement of, of being in lands of the original peoples and how original peoples took care of this land and their relationship to the earth. Um, you know, and, and that's in living in harmony and, and, and recognizing that just as the earth takes care of us, we need to take care of her. Sorry, sounds like an appropriate uh, Earth Day Eve send off. <laughs> Olga, thank you so much for being here and Phil. Sure. Yeah. Thank you all. And thanks to everybody who uh, was here. We've, but thank you so much for attending. We appreciate it.